what rhetorical significance do you feel the um, digital archive of literacy narratives has made? Well, I'm not sure this is a rhetorical difference. I can tell you what I'm proudest of about the DALN and what I think it's accomplished within our field. I, I think we now have as a profession a common corpus of literacy narratives that anybody can study and that everybody can study and that we can come at from so many different angles uh, because those stories are there and they're recorded for history and they're preserved and they're available to people who want to use those or to contribute to the to the collection I, and that in itself is an important um, professional contribution I think I'm very proud of that particular contribution but even more important I think it gives the profession an understanding of what can happen when you take on these big humanities projects um, where the effort of creating them and the burden of creating the project not just the money but the effort of maintaining it and creating it and contributing to it and then using it is shared by many people in the profession and it shows what we can do when we put our heads together in a collective effort to create something that everybody can benefit from if they have a connection to the internet and to me that's a tremendous lesson and I'm not sure that people really understand the, uh, the importance of that lesson. Um, I think people um, like Sandra Pearl understand. She was, uh, after we started the DALN for instance, the Writing Tree project that she started was also a crowdsourced project and she came to me and asked what had we learned from doing the DALN that would translate into success for the writing tree. And I think she understood the importance of that model of big humanities. What can we do together, collectively, that the whole profession can benefit from? And I think that people at the four C's especially I might say the staff members at the Four C's, the people uh, like Jackie Biddle who um, were conference organizers or Eileen Maley um, who have always made a place for the DAL and because they understand that that historical record that we're um, uh, sedimenting right now will be available for study in years to come and I think that is key I think it's absolutely key. I, if we don't do it, who is going to do it? And if we don't do it now, when are we ever going to start an effort like that? So I guess the last thing that I'm happiest about is that somebody like Ben McCorkle and uh, Michael Harker, Ben at uh, Ohio State uh, Mansfield, and um, uh, I'm sorry, Ohio State Marion, and uh, Michael Harker at Georgia State uh, will be the new directors of the DAL and, and take that forward in time uh, so that the effort goes on because we never know who's going to use those archives, these archives, who's going to use it in the future, what benefit it's going to bring, what contributions it can make. Um, and I, I think that that um, I think carrying forward it's going to become increasingly valuable. So do you have any stories about um, experiences where you see the um, DALN has made an impact? Yeah, I have a story of the class I'm teaching this term that you're in because every time we teach the literacy narratives of Black Columbus class here at Ohio State, what we do is get undergraduate students graduate students and community members together on teams and they go out into uh, black Columbus communities and they um, provide an opportunity for uh, citizens to tell stories about 
their literacy and how literacy has impacted their life and how their lives have impacted their uh, literacy skills and understandings and values. And um, teams get to choose uh, an area of interest. We've done uh, black churches in Columbus, uh, and it's given congregations and pastors uh, and um, citizens, individual citizens, an opportunity to think about how the black church has encouraged, sustained, and supported literacy um, in the United States going forward in history. That's a big opportunity and I think it makes a big change in the lives of individuals to understand just those connections. In the class that we're teaching right now, for instance, we have a team going out into the LGBTQ uh, community and um, providing an opportunity for uh, citizens to tell their stories about literacy and uh, sexual orientation, the intersection of those um, formations. And we have your team going out into the Somali community and talking to Somali immigrants about how literacy uh, and the challenges of um, acquiring literacy and a new language, a new culture, a new environment has shaped their lives and their understandings and their values over time from generation to generation and within the very complex um, context of a brand new uh, cultural setting um, at a time in history when they have experienced all the turmoil and violence of a war um, in their homeland, bringing that experience to the United States. We can learn a lot from that experience. Uh, and so I think that makes a big difference to uh, just providing people the opportunity to tell their stories and to tell a story that might run counter to some of the, the uh, more um, accepted narratives uh, that we get through the media. Uh, these are individual people's experiences and values and sometimes they they adhere to the larger stories and sometimes they depart from it, but they always are instructive in so many ways. So what are some of the directions the DALN has gone? Did it go in the directions you thought it would go? Has there been any, any surprises? Um, where do you feel like it'd be headed? Uh, well, one of the surprises with the DALN, I, I thought when we started it, when Louie and I were working on it, uh, logical structure. I thought that the best way would be to make a, uh, a um, structure that asked the same questions of everybody and gave them a controlled vocabulary for responding. So I would ask things like, uh, what state do you live in? And then I'd give 50 or so opportunities and they'd have to choose, you know, Alaska, uh, Nebraska, Ohio, whatever. Um, Louis, however, in all his brilliance, uh, talked this talked me into thinking about this as a folksonomy. That is, you might ask the question, but there was no controlled vocabulary for responding. So, if I would were to ask something like, um, "What is your uh, uh, sexual orientation?" or would you like to self-identify with regard to your sexual orientation? If I had had forced choice, it would have been gay, straight, you know, maybe I'd have two or three different choices. But with a folksonomy, individuals uh, put in their own identifying term, and because they use their own identifying term, and because they are located in time and space, the terms that they choose also become data for anybody thinking about how to look at the um, how to look at the narratives and the literacies that happen, uh, for example, if uh, we'd had a controlled vocabulary, we might have chosen uh, what if, to a question like "What is your race?" We might have had African American, Caucasian, you know, four or five different um, 
selections, but because we opened it up to people's own description, we find out that some generations prefer to talk, to use the term African Americans, some generations and some people blacks, some generations and people African oriented. You know, there are, there might be 20 terms for uh, race in the DALN, uh, there might be 20 terms for sexual orientation in the DALN, and all of those terms, uh, all of those choices provide us data about how people self-identify and then carry that self-identification into some connection with literacy.